All right, Luke, um, you and I just uh, came back both from uh, Germany, of all places, which it would have sounded way different if this was 80 years ago. But uh, that sort of side, not much time to go through what was cooking in the markets this past week. But luckily, there wasn't all that much happening as far as I understand it either. Um, Highlander Silver had some interesting news, getting some heavy hitters into the story. So we'll, we'll play a recording of our conversation that we did with the CEO um, later on. Fireweed Zinc had some interesting – this actually might be a good point to start with because – during the conferences, the, the the conference there was a lot of speculation. So the the Deutsche Gold mess uh, has um, people who visit. But there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of influencers or whatever you want to call it. A lot of Twitter people go there, and so a lot of them obviously know Brandon. They know the entire story um, of of Fireweed. A lot of them like and support Brandon, and so there was a lot of speculation as to what might have happened, but. Fireweed was scheduled to give a presentation during the the Deutsche Goldmesse, and the uh, Braden didn't didn't arrive, so he wasn't there. And then speculation started, and then the news release came in on when did it come in? On Friday, Friday was mm. it, right? Yep. Yeah, something yep. like that. Well, uh, I don't know if there's really a point to it because nobody really knows anything. Everybody was asking questions. I sent Brandon a message inviting him, so eventually he might come on to the podcast again. But uh, nobody really knows what happened. With this, uh, with this news release, and the title reads: "Fireweed announces management changes and adds strength to its leadership." So, um, Brandon McDonald has been replaced as as CEO. Some people are saying the Lundins are taking control. Other people are saying the Lundins want to uh, steal Yukon and and turn it into one big mine. I don't even know what's happening. What are you making of all this thing? Yeah, uh, I don't want to start speculating too much. Uh, I mean, we can for sure uh, look at some facts and conclusions. I mean, it it for sure became very abrupt. Maybe not. Maybe Brandon knew this for a while because his we had the impression that his posts online were going down a bit recently. Maybe, but that's that's speculation already. Uh, it it was abrupt and and nobody really saw this coming. And and the wording and the way it was brought was not. It could have been more respectful after all those years, I think. So uh, uh, we cannot go way further uh, without starting to speculate what happened. But um, for sure, the Lundins came in. A lot of those people, a lot of their people uh, in the other Lundin companies, became interim or maybe even permanently installed in Fireweed. So. That it's important to them, this company. It's obvious. Um, why this and why this now is complete speculation. And I guess at some point in the future, these things will never co completely remain silent. I think uh, we will see. Um, hmm. Fireweed went up, which is a bit bi bitter for Brandon, but I don't think uh, it has anything to do with him. I think he did a good job. And um, if if the Lundins go all in on something or show that their team jumps in like with montage a month ago or two months ago, then people see, Hey, Lundin, let's buy this. And of course they were a shareholder, but now they become more active or maybe activist uh, with all their own people, um, which is probably a sign that this is one of their five or 10 Lundin family companies. And, uh, and that often is a positive sign. And that's why the stock is up, not because Brandon left and people are happy that he, left i think to the opposite people were surprised and and maybe not even so happy with it but uh probably something happened maybe difference of opinion about the future of the company and um the big shareholder likely stepped in it, yeah weird that the stock price went up like I, I looked at it uh i think i think many people didn't expect it there was one newsletter writer also who didn't expect that. I think he told his people to get out or something along those lines. That was a little bit of a mini drama too. There's a lot that we can say about speculation. In the end, I'm thinking to what avail? Like, why would we even speculate? What do we What do we even do? At all the, it could be interesting. We could be gossiping a whole lot. Um, but what does this end in? And there's kind of like one main question for me here is that the Lundins don't typically do things for no reason. <laughs> they they do stuff very strategically all the way back from as far as I understand the story of Adolf uh, Lundin, who you've also written about. They do everything very strategically. Maybe that's just come, it runs in the family or something. So what I'm wondering about is, is this a strategic move into the Yukon, as I kind of alluded to? Uh, but there's another very big player in the Yukon 
uh, with that being Snowline, who also has strong backers, with that being B2. And so, yeah, what do you, that, that's kind of the only thing that matters to me here is like, is this a strategic move into the Yukon? Do we start getting into, do we start looking more into the Yukon because the Lundins are um, in, increasing their presence over there? Or is it, can there be a neur neurology play or something among those lines? That's what I'm thinking. The only thing that matters to me, I suppose. Yeah, I look at it a bit differently um, because they were investors already. It's a very big zinc project. Um, and these type of investors do not play with small deposits anymore. That's a waste of their time. And this is a big zinc deposit. It's important to them. They care about big copper deposits, big zinc deposits, perhaps in the future, big lithium deposits, big oil. Uh, so I think they just want to secure their interest in the company. And I guess that there's some sort of difference in strategic thinking perhaps in the future um i'm not really connecting it with snowline at all uh, some people did um and who knows there's some some synergy there I'm, I'm not debating that but i think this is just securing their interest in this project and perhaps they even rename it lundin zinc uh, i said that to someone on friday and i, and I looked online and i saw that many people came with the, with the same cre creative idea uh but it wouldn't surprise me if this is their zinc play that they would rename it Lundin Zinc at some point. It doesn't really matter. It's an important investment for them. And for some reason, they stepped in. And I bought stock at the open, not because I'm happy that Brendan is gone, but because I recognize that when the Lundins go in uh, and take control, like with Montage, they were also investors, stepped in with a bigger investment and with more people that they surround themselves with. It often means that... Uh, it is one of the Lundin companies, like one of the Warwick companies, one of the Lassonde companies. Those companies are well followed. And um, so I didn't buy it because Brandon left. I bought it because Lundin uh, showed their increased interest, uh, uh, maybe for other reasons than I would normally buy. But um, yeah, uh, and that's, I think, as far as we can go. And we will. Yeah, let's leave it at that. There's also, yeah. there's just too much talking about again just kind of gossiping um i'll leave that for the comment section uh I, well i i i'm gonna enjoy it because it's gonna help out the algorithm of course but i don't think there's anything too actionable in this one either um before we get into highlander uh play the recording here and then talk about who richard work really is uh let's talk about you wanted to talk about avanti gold something happened there i'm not following too closely so what's happening yeah this is um um, I mean, we, we think and talk a lot about, you know, do we want to align ourselves with people like Richard Bork or Highlander uh, with the big names? Uh, Avanti is a stock that I've noticed over the last couple of weeks was selling off. And I never heard about it before, but, but suddenly it showed up in my list of probably losers or um, I, it showed up in some list that I follow. And, and I noticed that the K2 fund was buying in the market um, and they already owned a lot of stock, but they were buying at 50 cents, 40 cents, 30 cents, 20, 10 cents. So the stock was really coming down. And uh, without going too far in detail, they have a project, a gold project in Africa. And um, and I, I don't even, to be honest, know a whole lot about it. I just noticed that there's a number of ounces in the ground and uh, the company seems cheap for what they have. But again, I didn't really look deep. I just saw the ounces and the grade, and I felt hmm, interesting. Uh, then uh, even um, two months ago, they added a senior advisor who is connected to La Mancha Network again. Uh, that person also joined Montage, a Lundin company. So <laughs> we have some connections here. Um, and then also they, they had another person to join, uh, which is uh, Sir Samuel Jonah, who's also a fairly big name in the African mining space. Um, but all this, the reason I was not sure there's an opportunity because all this selling looked so odd to me. I mean, as if somebody really wanted to get rid of their shares, uh, it was not just bottoming out. It was really selling off. And the really odd thing is they buy a new project in South Africa, uh, on Botswana, I think. Um, and they pay 39 million shares for that which is almost their full full outstanding shares right now, without even explaining that property uh, properly. Uh, there's very little description in the news release. And after this news release, the stock went up to 16 cents on volume. Uh, I missed it. I didn't buy it. But this is an example where you can align yourself, apparently, with 
new management coming in, pretty big names coming in. Maybe we can even say networks coming in. Um, yeah, I still don't understand why they issue so many shares for a project that they are not even describing. Uh, normally, when you issue 50% or 70% of your outstanding stock, so you double your share count almost for a new project, then you provide a very detailed description of what you are really buying, and they didn't. Uh, but some people know it's good news because the stock went up from 11 cents to 16. Uh, so I think this is a story to be continued. Uh, I missed it so far. Maybe it's still an opportunity. I don't. I really don't know. Uh, but the K2 fund was interested enough to buy in the market and lower their average. And um, it wouldn't surprise me that this stock uh, has way more upside. Uh, but I'm not saying buy the stock right now. I'm just explaining my doubts and my interest here. And uh, I think it's a story to be continued. Is there a royalty in this project? I think, well, there's almost no news about, about this project by, uh, at all. So um, the description is as short as I've ever seen it for a acquisition like this. It's it's really the, the project name, the, the project country, that it's an arm's length deal, I think, uh, that 29 million shares will be paid. And there is not much more than that. Hmm. 29 million shares, that still places them at what's less than 80 million shares outstanding? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Less than eighty. So it's still like it's uh, probably now it's no longer an eight million dollar company. If you include this, it's probably going towards fourteen, fifteen million. But I mean I cannot value it. I can just notice that all this selling is odd and all these people coming in, uh, and then this deal and these things often do not happen for no reason. And maybe this is a very important deal, maybe this is a very promotable project. Um I don't know the answer, but it is. There is more to this. I, I am, I am, pretty confident to conclude that. Yeah, very interesting. This is going to be one of those stories we come back to. Uh, again, if someone's connected to management, Antonio at resourcetalks.com. That's my email address. Send us an introduction or whatever. We'd be happy to speak to them, and give them a fair right. Let's uh, let's move over to Highlander Silver. Luke, the headline reads, Highlander Silver announces $9.2 million strategic financing by the Lundins, Richard Work, and Eric Sprott. And uh, this is going to be an easier thing because we actually spoke to their CEO when we were in um, Germany. Well, he wasn't in Germany, but that's just when we did. So uh, here's our interview with David Fincham. All right, Dave, um, I'm looking at a sort of a spectacular headline and the market would would agree with me given what's happened to your stock price this week um but you're announcing a 9.2 million dollar strategic financing you call it uh with three big names that you don't typically see in one story at the same time and i don't want to sound overly excited because i don't know all that much about the story but i'm seeing these names and a bunch of things start running through my head so why don't you walk me through whatever's happening here Sure. So obviously, we're very happy to announce the, the, the strategic financing. Um, I think what um, aligns all of these strategic investors is 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 around the concept of Highlander Silver um, and the, and the asset. So perhaps it would be helpful for me to step back a bit and talk about um, those two things. Um, so so Highlander is, has been set up as a counter cyclical silver vehicle. So we're very bullish on silver. Uh, I think we all know about the trends of increasing um, industrial demand versus more or less uh, flat mine supply. And so we see the fundamentals for, for silver as being, as being very bullish um, and, our, and our shareholders are aligned with, with, with that concept. So the, the idea of Highlander um, uh, is to bring on world-class potential assets uh, that have very strong exploration upside and therefore value creation potential. And then we add value uh, through exploration and, and discovery of, of, of more high-grade ounces. So we spent um, a little over two years uh, looking for the right asset, and we announced the acquisition of the San Luis project in, in November last year. This is a high-grade uh, gold-silver epithelial deposit in the Ancash region of, of, of Peru. Um, we can probably get into the detail of San Luis a bit later on, uh, but essentially there's a very high grade historical resource, uh, what we believe to be one of the highest grade resources of its size yet to be mined in the world. 
within an underexplored vein field. So the thesis is that we can find several more of these veins um, and build a multi-million ounce deposit through systematic and successful exploration. Okay. So, so kind of those are the, the those the, those are the two ingredients. And obviously, what we need to do is, as well as that is put together a team that could execute on our strategy. And we've been focusing on doing that as well over the last eighteen months or so. You uh, again to go back to that headline. You call it a strategic financing. What, what, what about what about it makes it strategic? I mean, are the Lundines, Richard Work, and Enrique Sprott gonna help you in that strategy, or how do you see that being strategic? But when we say strategic, we we mean long term uh, shareholders with financial strength um, um, that are aligned with with what we're trying to do. So, mm -hmm. to mean it in that sense. Uh, I'm also wondering there, having long term shareholders is something a lot of companies will will want to attract over time. But at the same time, you're, the stock is very illiquid or has been very illiquid. And I'm just wondering, isn't this going to make it even more illiquid over time? And how do you solve the liquidity issue here? So I think we're, we're you know, we're focusing at this stage. We're really at the beginning of the story for, for Highlander. Um, the stock has moved a lot. And, you know, we're, we're now up to, I think at yesterday's close, about a 43 million market cap. But if you look at our, our project and the potential there, to where we want to take it, we're still really at the starting stages of the of the company, the beginning of the story, and so our focus from a from a, um, a a structure point of view is to have a tight structure at the beginning, so that we're well set up for the future. And and and, and in terms of that liquidity point, um, yeah, if you look historically back, there hasn't been a whole lot of volume, but there has been on the on the, on the release of this news. So I think um, you know there is demand, and you can still. Uh, buy shares in the market. Hmm. So it, it, is that are you going to be doing something actively uh, on that liquidity part? Like, are you going and doing more marketing now that you have these guys in and the money and and potentially closing on that deal soon? Um, yeah, what what are you doing to solve it? Um, absolutely, we'll be working on getting the story out. Um, you know, at the moment we've been focused on the, the things I was talking about before, bringing the asset on, getting the team together. Uh, and so, yeah, the next stages are, are all about getting the story out and, of course, doing the exploration to make new discoveries on the property. Mm. I have one more point before I, I give the word to to Luke here. Um, you mentioned the structure, and I, I open up your presentation to look at the capital structure slide. 60 million shares outstanding, 30 million options, uh, 30 million warrants, excuse me, 1.4 million options. So about a third of your fully diluted shares is warrants. Um I know from personal experience that these the guys that are entering right now are not a fan of overhang uh, in, in any way. Was that part of the conversation when they started going in? Is there is there a plan for these options to do something with them, or do you just wait for them to be exercised or or potentially ex expire eventually? I think I think the point with the options is that they're in the the hands of the strategic investors. Hmm. So so these these uh, these options aren't going to find their way to the market, and so. Um, uh, we don't see it really too much of a, as, as an overhang for the company. Okay. And, and I meant warrants, excuse me, I just said options because I was looking at the... Sorry, yeah, yeah, but, uh, exactly, yeah. warrants, it's, yeah. It's the... It's a, what, what is the... What are, what are they priced at? Uh, I think it might warrants be... Warrants are at 15 cents. Okay. And and, and of course, the, the slide on the, on, on the website at the moment is is pre this financing. Mm -hmm. So once we close, we'll be, we'll be updating that slide. Yeah, no, no warrants in this financing, am I right? No. Okay, good. Well, I think that's about it on the on the on the surface level. I know Luke, you want to dig deeper, so go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to go a couple of years back. Uh, perhaps before you started, uh, the company uh, was called Lido Minerals, and there was even a deal to buy the Hercules Silver property, which uh, last year became a big uh, discovery. That deal was terminated. Um, has the company been in search for good properties ever since, or was it initially those other uh, Peru projects that were the flagship of the company? Uh, so did, did something change? Did you want to like explore really early stage in Peru, or was from that moment on was the goal to find a bigger project uh, with a bit of work done already uh, versus just the Greenfields project that you already have in your portfolio? With that original listing of Highlander, that from from that 
from that uh, uh, point, the focus is, uh, has been on Peru. Mm -hmm. And so as you've seen, we've had a, a couple of historical projects. Um, mm -hmm. And then really, um, since I came on about 18 months ago, we've kind of um, got more focused on, on uh, looking for the right asset over the past 18 months. So, 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 so yeah, the, the, the real focus of Highland has always been in Peru. In those projects, the ones that you have in Peru, are they now really low priority or is it is everything still a priority, but you just acquire the flagship, but the other projects will still be uh, maintained and explored or is it really, you know, not a priority anymore and now it's off to San Luis? So, so we have two projects on, on, on the books we will do when we close the San Luis deal, aiming for uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so it'll be San Luis and La Estrella. So San Luis is, is and we can talk about the detail of the project, but again, very high grade um, um, gold, silver, vein field. At La Estrella is disseminated mineralization and open pit target in a different part of Peru, in the southern part of Peru. We still um, think this is a, a high quality project with good potential. Um, so we will have our flagship is, is San Luis, but the aim is to continue exploring and adding value to La Estrella. All right, and maybe maybe an odd time of asking, but what was the time you came in? Uh, were you approached by the company to take this over and, and start this search for a flagship project? Or did yeah. you come in when the project was already found and your skill sets fit well to that project? Or I, I was recruited by Highlander to to come in and 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 uh, you know develop the concept that we discussed. Um, and um, San Luis was kind of on the radar. And we looked at several other assets over that 18 months period. Uh, and San Luis was by far the, the most attractive uh, asset. And so we took the decision to, to bring that on. What's, what's your own background then? Uh, did you work for other big companies before or also in the junior mining space? A, a, a little bit of a mixture. I, I'm an exploration geologist. Uh, I started my career at um, Apex Silver's San Cristobal project in Bolivia, Silver Lead Zinc mm. project. Um, and then I was with Anglo American for uh, 17 years. At Anglo, I was regional head of discovery for Americas, um, really focused on, on copper exploration and discovery and led a successful team. We added significant resources across the, the mines and found out several new uh, mineral systems in the greenfield space. Um, and relevant to this role was, is that I was uh, responsible for Peru with Anglo. So uh, know the country, understand the geology, um, and that's obviously something I, I bring to the table in, in this role. And you are based in South America, so you speak Spanish, I guess, or? Yeah, m most of my career has been in South America. I've lived in, in Bolivia, uh, Chile, and now Colombia. And I've been, been based in Colombia for the last few years. Mm -hmm. That's not the most Colombian accent I'm hearing right there. <laughs> well, I'm British. Say something in Spanish so people believe you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay, the, the deal itself. Um, I think that was October, Novemberish, uh, when Highlander acquired or announced the acquisition of the San Luis project uh, in Peru. Historical MNI resources of three hundred and forty-eight thousand ounces, grading twenty-two grams gold, and nine million ounces of uh, grading five hundred and seventy-eight grams silver. Mm -hmm. um, I just looked it up, SSR, uh, which was before Silver Standards. I think joint venture this project in 2005 um, when they started exploring as well together with Esperanza Silver. So why are they selling this project right now to you? Uh, is it not of their scale or um, what reason are they selling it? And why are you, why do you like it enough to buy it for 45 million US, 42 million US and a 4% royalty? So I think it's the, the scale point is 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 a is a is an important point. You know that resource on it on itself, although very attractive, um, for a company like SSR, um, probably won't move the needle. Um, and so and and I think that combined with the fact that they're focused elsewhere in the in in the world, San Luis became a non-core, and they're looking for a company that could uh, explore this and and do it justice. Uh, um, SSR retainer. NSR on the property, um, four percent, two percent. We can buy back for fifteen million anytime before production. So they're maintaining exposure, 
Um, but now it's in a in a company that can really focus on it and and you know unlock the value. Um, so you're saying it, it's it's too small for them, or uh, like the potential is too small for them because they are a one and a half billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. uh, They're not like a major in the ten billion dollar range. Yeah. I guess with a team that backing you is also not looking for smallest projects. So it must have been yeah. on the edge of their size then. Yeah. I, well, I, you know, I can't speak for them, but the, you know, that resource is modest. What, what in size, what we see is the potential to repeat that resource several mm. times in this vein field. And uh, they didn't really have an exploration focus on the project. So, you know, the value creation potential we see, there are several other prospects on the, on the property. Um, quartz veining, high grade gold at surface. There's another prospect called La Bonita with a historical, two historical drill holes. Um, one ran 35 meters at five and a half grams gold with a, an intercept of 3.2 meters um, at 30 grams gold, 115 grams silver. So from, from our perspective, you know, uh, that really speaks to the, um, the, the, the high grade potential of the mineral system. And those two, uh, the island resource uh, and La Bonita, there's 10 kilometers between them. Several other prospects that haven't been drilled and large areas that haven't been mapped. So that's what we're really excited about is this is you know, when we see potential for developing for this turning into a multi million ounce project. How are you looking at country risk? Uh, I think Peru is opening up uh, a bit more. I think two years ago, nobody wanted to be there. And right now, you see many companies going back in. Uh, what has changed over the last couple of years? So, so the um, the time you're referring to is the the, the abrupt change of, of the Castillo presidency, um, and what what that sparked off um, was social unrest across the country, which um, you know gave Peru uh, a bad name internationally. That unrest actually was peaked and and, and troughed very quickly. And the Boluarte government that that, um, uh, that took over from Castillo has really been very uh, traditional, I, I would say, in terms of in terms of mining and the, and the rest of the economy. And so that stability returned very quickly. Um, and uh, we can see th tangible things uh, that are supportive of of uh, a good investment, uh, supportive of Peru being a good investment destination. So last year we saw the approval of. Uh, Asafranal, um, and this year we saw the approval of uh, the Antamina expansion. So that's at the kind of the at the, at the mine uh, scale, and the government's also very conscious that that uh, mining's uh, a key input into the economy, and we've seen improvements at the exploration uh, level in terms of permitting. So they've been making some changes, like being able to um, parallelize some of the um, permitting processes for drilling. Which uh, which speed things up. So so I think I think it was a you know a, a a peak about two years ago. But now actually looking at what's happening on the ground, both in terms of approvals and changes to policy, um, I think we're seeing very positive things. And is this the um, the only project? I mean, of course, you have got the projects in inside the company which are more greenfields. I think this one is a bit more advanced. At least you have a sort of a model already, and you will be doing work to improve that model and start drilling. Um, is this for the moment the only big acquisition or is there a strategy of, we are looking at way more, uh, we wanna have another big project on our hands and we are gonna expand even further? For the, for the time being in the short term, we're absolutely focused on uh, getting things right at San Luis. So that means getting on the ground, uh, building our own relationships with the, with the communities um, and doing the upfront technical work uh, right at the start, and, and so, so what do I mean by that? In in, in a vein field like this that hasn't been explored um, systematically, um, we need to we need to really get a handle on the controls on mineralization, understand where the veins are trending, uh, and develop a model that's predictive, which means we can we can target the best areas uh, and and drill in the most optimized way that's uh, least dilutive for shareholders. So our focus over the next several months is is that. Uh, in terms of other acquisitions in the future, we're always open to to, to great opportunities. Um, but again, the, the near term focus is is our is our current portfolio. Hmm. The money that you have right now, how far how far does that get you corporately in terms of burden rate and all that? 
So this should um, this pays for the for the acquisition um, and gets us to um, uh, developing drill targets. Okay. What are you budgeting for GE and &E and 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 the marketing and all that that you just told me this year? Um, for this year, total will be uh, just over a million. Okay. Is that is part of that? Because and this goes back to the comment I made about the liquidity. Would part of that be seeking a duo listing or a relisting on another exchange? Because and where I'm coming from with this, because both of us are European, uh, when it's on the CSC, there are certain certain challenges for us, for example, to uh, trade the stock. For for me personally, that's under forty million dollars in market cap. I believe I cannot. Well, not a problem anymore for you. But I know that for some people that might be a hundred million or so on and so forth. So, it, are you planning any any relisting or dual listing? We're, we're certainly considering considering um, the options in that space and and looking at that very carefully. We haven't announced anything about that yet, um, but that would be a you know a natural step for the for the future. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll look back to you. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, that's good questions. Um, I was just wondering. Um... You mentioned communities. Is there, well, there's always risk, but what is the experience you have in this part of Peru with communities? Are they uh, mining focused? Are they against mining? Uh, I mean, consultation is always important, but in general, what do you know about this area already? Sure. Uh, you know, just to start off at the, the level of, of, of principles of, of how we do how we do business, you know, um, Social license and license to operate in general has to be front and center. So we put a lot of um, uh, attention into, into that. In, in terms of the, the local environment around San Luis, um, we are 25 kilometers west of Pierina. So that's Barrick's um, um, gold mine, which produced over 8 million ounces of gold. That shut down about two years ago, I think. And so this is a mining region. There's now um, obviously th th those. Um, those, in, those positions for employment uh, don't exist. So I think at the kind of regional scale, um, uh, a new mining project would be welcome. And there's that culture because of this, this production that's happened uh, in the past at, at Pierina. And Antamina, it's further away, about 70 kilometers to the east, but that's also Ancash. So the province is very much a mining region uh, with a mining culture. Um, at a lo local scale, we have a drill permit and a community agreement in place um, at San Luis. So we're looking to get onto the ground and develop that. Hmm. How long are those uh, valid? The um, agreements? The, the drill permit is about 25 months, something like that. And the community agreement was signed for, for five years uh, in May last year. Hmm. Okay. So that's there's no is that covering your complete project as you see the project right now or is there are there areas outside of that that area that you would like to explore but is currently not within that area of of agreement? Yeah, there, there are other areas that we that um we want to get an agreement on and yeah, we'll be working on to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, this is a good intro. Uh, Antonio, do you have anything else you, uh, on your mind? It is a good intro. I agree, and we should, uh, David. We should maybe follow it up with a more, um, with a lengthier conversation once you've closed everything and, and you have more to talk about. Uh, talk a little bit about the geology. Show me targets and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, this is a good intro. I don't have anything else to ask here. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much for the well, thanks for joining. Yeah. Right. Thanks so much for uh, uh, making this happen last minute, Dave. Was it? Uh, I think we are the first. The first show you uh, you're on, right? Because I was googling today and I didn't find any other interview with you so far. Uh, or did I miss anything? Um, the first major one, I think. So, so looking forward to 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 getting the word out more over the next few months as we discussed. Good. Is All it? Right. Is, hey, thanks is a lot. It, is All right. it because Take people care. are not reaching out, or is it just because you you looked at us and you thought, oh, there's two pretty guys. I want to talk to them. They're very good looking. <laughs> <laughs> I no answer. <laughs> I thought it'd be an interesting conversation. That's a good political yeah. answer. We we get that a lot. Thanks though. <laughs> Thank you. Well, enjoy the rest of the mining conference, and uh, yeah, look forward to staying in touch.
Right. Okay. So this was our conversation with David, uh, the CEO of Highlander Silver, and I'll have to get him back on for a longer conversation eventually. But let's, um, Luke, let's talk for a while for a second here about Richard Wark, because I actually don't know too much about him. Uh, you did write, you looked a, a, a good deal into him. You wrote a good blog on it a, a while back. Uh, people can find it on um, on Twitter at Gold Discovery One, I believe on LinkedIn and on the website as well. And um, but so you also sent me this, <clears throat> excuse me, this newspaper thing where it says that he was born on January 3, 1960. He was born at six pounds and 14 ounces, which I then had to look it up in normal people's metric system terms to about uh, 3.1 kilograms. And then I had to call my mom just out of curiosity. So I, I actually called her up this morning and I asked her how heavy I was when I was born and apparently I was born in almost 3.5 kilograms. I was a heavy baby. I was 3.450 to be specific. And so I was about 10% bigger than him when I was born and he's now a billionaire. So I'm starting to like my chances here already, but what, what else did, what else did he do to get to the point where he's at right now? Yeah. Thanks Antonio. This, um, he's a interesting guy because he's one of the, the big wheels in the industry, I think together with, uh, Ross Beattie and Pierre Lassonde and Friedland and those names. Um, but if you really start searching on his name, you don't find much more than him being a important person in the business and uh, his three or four or five big successes. Uh, but I always wondered, like, how did he start? And there's not much information out there about it. Uh, but when you start looking into old newspapers, which I did, uh, starting in the 1960s, uh, when he was born even, um, the story came together quite well, but it's all based on desktop research. Um, but I was surprised how much I could find in old newspapers. And uh, as far as I can see, he became involved in the junior mining business in the early 80s. And very quickly, uh, Murray Pezim took him under his wing. And Pezim is probably one of the most famous promoters of all time. Um, very colorful, colorful character. And um, I mean, he was involved in many, many stock deals. Um, he was also a media character, uh, was involved. He organized a boxing match between Muhammad Ali and um, George Chuvalu, I think, uh, which ended up in a financial disaster for him. Um, he was also a real character. Um, he has been fined a couple of times by the BC Security Commission. So he was like a, a real good promoter, but also had some, some uh, let's just say, negative sides, uh, but involved in many discoveries. And Richard Bork, uh, the first press release I found was in 1983, I think. And that's when he became the president of one of those PESIM companies. And um, and very quickly after, the, after, after that, the um, Hemlo discovery happened in 1982, I think. And um, so he quickly was bitten by the bug, I guess, uh, because he, he became the president of, of many, many companies uh, in uh, Murray's uh, stable, I, uh, I could say. Mm -hmm. I think you can find negative things, as you said, about everyone, uh, especially at, at those levels of wealth, if you dig deep enough but i'm sure the youtube comments are going to do that that for us so i'm I'm not necessarily going to dive into it here what i'm wondering specifically is how much of this is and this is it's very personal for me so how much is is brains versus how much is luck because if it's luck i can still keep hoping if it's brains i might have to give up but so how much of this is skill versus luck do you think of what he's achieved so far well if you, if you read right now what people say about him, uh, I mean, uh, people like Ross Beattie have lots of good things to say. And there's a Canadian leading M&A lawyer who had some, uh, he said that he's exceptional in creating value. And of course, that's easy to say right now because now we know what what he achieved. Uh, I think in the 80s, um, I, I don't know because I I didn't talk to him. But based on desktop research, you can see that he became the president of many companies of PESM and, and PESM was the guy at the time. Um, so I think he was for sure, um, very motivated and of course young. So he became part of an enormous list of companies in the eighties. He was involved in Templar mining, and that was just only the eighties. Um, and I think, I don't know if he made a lot of money at the time. Uh, he did get an option grant, uh, from PESM 
And that option grant was just days before the big essays came out on SK Creek. And PESM has been, um, he came into pro trouble with the regulators because of it. And he also admitted it in uh, a number of books that were written about PESM that this was, uh, that this happened. But I think he, uh, so he admitted it, but of course he uh, explained why he did it. It was, it was not the company making the discovery. It was a company with shares in Calpine, uh, the company making the discovery. Um, so coming back to the question, I think he was for sure in a very good network of people, and mm. um, and I'm not also sure that you cannot, <laughs> you you must have some talents to uh, to get so many positions, uh, and and you need to be reliable. Uh, but I think only in the '90s he got into his own deals. He started to do his own deals, and um, and he even got involved in a wood company, for example. Mm. You're just trying to depress me here on a Sunday. Because you're telling me I need talent to make any something out of this, but uh, what what history is written by the winners though? That's what I wrote down here because that reminds me of it. Because he took some serious risks with those uh, with those companies that you mentioned, and he keeps doing it now. I mean, as we speak, he keeps taking serious risks, right? So, and part of it is is absolutely due to to brains and and networking and skill and and experience and so on and so forth. As you mentioned, he started in his early 20s. Uh, but there's definitely going to be luck involved in it as well. So this may be a point where we can also talk about taking risks. Like how how was he able to take that many risks and then still come out of it? He did have a hard period in between there that you also sent me some stuff about. So what, what exactly happened? Well, I think it's it's crucial if you really want to become, become so wealthy that you uh, get enormous amounts of paper. So you get big positions in small companies. And of course, most of these companies fail. And um, the list that I just mentioned proves that because not many of those companies are well known right now. Um, so they probably didn't really uh, lead to big success. Um, but in the 90s, um, he got involved in some wood deal, which I think was going quite well for him. Um, but, but in 1998, he filed for personal bankruptcy. Again, this is all desktop research. I don't really, I don't really know what led to it, but um, but at the time there was a document, a government document, that really showed all his uh, positions uh, in Augusta Gold, Augusta Medals. Um, so he built his brand at the time. Uh, the Augusta brand already started in the mid '90s, and he was just 35 or 30, 38 in 1998 uh, when he he filed for bankruptcy. And all his his complete net worth was three hundred and eleven thousand dollars, which included his seven thousand dollar furniture. Um, um, but it also shows that um, um, you can go from three hundred thousand dollars of net worth after almost twenty years in the business to become a billionaire just twenty years later. Um, so I think he saved his share positions. He didn't have to sell them in this bankruptcy case, and um, he got out of it and and started building companies again. And even in the 90s, he uh, he built companies. I mean, he was involved in Pass Lake Resorts. And uh, Enterprises, Augusta Resorts. And he even did a bit of a, an uh, internet deal with Cybercom uh, Systems. Um, but those Augusta companies started to become successful because he um, bought a property in Arizona, uh, which became his first big win. Uh, which was the Rosemont Copper Project. And mm. in 2005, that was. So that was a number of years later already. And um, and the market started recognizing after drilling it that this project really had tier one potential. And Richard, who was described already in, 90, in the 1980s in the Vancouver Sun as a very skilled negotiator, uh, made a deal with Sumitomo, uh, got a 40% premium on the stock and... So this story started really going well. Uh, it was recognized by companies, Sumitomo, it was recognized by the market. The stock went up and finally it was, was taken over by Hood Bay for $555 million. And what um, Richard got out of it was $28 million. So I think this was his big score, his first big score in, 90, in 2014, I think this was. Hmm. What 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 did you say three hundred and seventeen or three hundred and seven thousand dollars in that um, bankruptcy document? Uh, yeah, three hundred and eleven thousand yeah, dollars. Oh, eleven. Right. Okay. Um, what pushed him to that price though? Because he was thirty eight 
at the time, he had been in resources for 18 years. I mean, he made more money than that in the meantime. Uh, so he must have made it, fell down to that 317, and then filed for bankruptcy. So what would, I mean, how did that happen? Well, of course, 1998 was a was a really difficult year in the mining business. Uh, so I think those share positions he owned were probably worth way more uh, because 1994, 1995 were really good years in the mining industry and some of his companies did well. Uh, so I don't know if this 311,000 number is completely correct, but it is, it's a government document saying that. Uh, but he secured his share positions. Um, and of course, it was just after the um, BREAC scandal when all the mining companies started to go down. So maybe it was just really at, at the worst point in his career. And it shows that he, uh, you know, got back on his legs and, and started eventually uh, the Augusta Resource Company with a copper deal. Uh, and even before he sold this Augusta Resource copper deal, he also uh, was involved in a big discovery called Vendetta. Uh, mm. So uh, this was a company that he started, I think, in 2008, and uh, made a discovery with numbers like 100 meters of 16 grams gold and uh, eventually was sold to uh, Batista, a Brazilian billionaire, for one and a half billion dollars. Um, and, and he got uh, $70 million out of this deal in, 20, um, in 2010 or 11. R Richard is welcome to, to come on the podcast and, <laughs> and obviously talk to us. Uh, I'd be more than happy. Um, and if someone knows him personally, got their email, or whatever, just send me an email at Antonio at resourcetalks.com. We love to speak to him. Um, <clears throat> Superb Crew spoke to him. Superbcrew.com spoke to him in 2019. Just found it here online. And it's uh, they asked them actually some of those questions where I asked you, was it um, what would you equate your success to after 30 years in the mining industry and so on and so forth? He says, it's experience, but you also have to have instincts and putting them together to try and create growth for investors. But then also they ask them, what's the secret ingredient to a successful deal? And Richard says, in the resource business, and I'm quoting, in the resource business, you have to recognize value and be able to create value for your investors. For good or bad, luck also has a lot to do with it. While being smart and strategic can lead you to promising discoveries, luck and timing play into being able to develop a project in a way that coincides with the right price environment. In addition, he says, it's important to have the right team behind you. I attribute my success, uh, skill management team, yada, 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 unquote. Now, something else that he doesn't mention here is is neurology. Um, he was involved in something that was close to Brie X at the time that actually had a, a good run as far as I could understand from your write-up on Twitter. So, yeah, talk to me about his neurology, neurology part of his life, basically. Yeah, so as far as I can see in all those companies, especially in the 90s when he started on his own, he staked a lot of ground uh, near discovery. So every time there was a discovery somewhere, um, he very quickly also staked ground in that area. And I think the area play was really a, a thing in the 90s. So if somebody made a discovery and somebody else staked some ground next door, sometimes the company staking ground would go up more than the real company because it... it these companies are often tiny, one or $2 million companies, and then going up to 10 or 20 X just because they own some ground over there. Uh, so I think this was also part of his initial strategy. And I think this is also something that Murray Pezim did. Um, and I think the secret is also in, of course, a lot of trying. I just mentioned all those companies only in the, in the 80s and 90s. I didn't even mention the 2000s yet. Um, so I think it is also important to have, I mean, <laughs> trying to become as rich as him, you need to have really big share positions in companies and, and keep on trying. And um, I mean, he was ex described as a skilled negotiator. Uh, I think you need uh, a level of charisma. Uh, people need to like you. You need to become somebody, you're almost praying. I mean, you're praying <laughs> together with people for a big success and people need to follow you into the success. Otherwise, your share price will never go up and you are not able to do a new deal again. Uh, so I, I guess we can conclude that he's for sure a deal maker. Um, he's a risk taker. Um, and he has tried it a lot of times. Um, and I think looking back to all his successes, which I think four or five really big ones, uh, out of a list I didn't even count of like 50 companies. Uh, so I think the, su the success is in not giving up, 
trying a lot. And of course, uh, I'm sure he's a smart man and not uh, just somebody who tries. 24, 25, I'm, I'm counting. 26, it's more than 50. Uh, the list that you have on here, that's more mm. than 50 companies. How many, what's his success rate? Like we could probably put a, a number on it. That's actually interesting because that could also give me hope. Uh, <laughs> but it, it also seems like the success rate might be weighted towards the end. It's not like if you say that his success rate is like 10%, it's not like he did nine bad deals, one successful, nine bad, one successful. He did 45 bad and then five successful or like 43 bad and then in in the middle two good and then a couple more bad and then i mean it was weighted towards the end does that make sense yeah so i think it's not completely fair to label it good and bad because um i didn't research all those companies individually and probably a number of them have been successful or maybe for a while been successful um but but the big wins certainly came after 2005 and of course if you have a big win behind your name people trust you more, people are willing to, you know, also invest in your name. And then you have a second win, Vendetta, Ventana. Uh, well, actually, Ventana f got quicker to the finish line than the Augusta company. Uh, so Ventana and Augusta were his first two deals. And then, of course, people are willing to invest with you. Your name is out there. Um, when you want to buy a property from a big company, the company is more willing to sell it to you because they know that you are able to finance the project. So I think... Right now, now now that he is probably 64, 65, and has a really big name, you know, even companies like SSR are willing to sell him a good project in his latest uh, company, Highlander. So I think the bigger your name gets in this business, of course, the easier it becomes. And he for sure tried it a lot, um, and and potentially there were some good successes in the, in the 80s and 90s that I didn't even notice. Uh, but certainly at the end. Uh, he made five or six or seven really big successes. And if you only call those ones successful and the rest bad, yeah, then you could call it 10%. Perhaps it's 20, but certainly not 50 or 80%. Um, so most companies in a, in a junior mining business fail or restructure. And I think restructure is also one of the skills that I think if, if you realize, somebody like him, if you realize your company is not doing well, it's also a skill to turn the situation in your advantage. One company was called Riva Gold, and it didn't really lead to anything, but it did have $8 million in the bank. And Riva Gold was taken over by Wildcat Silver. And Wildcat was drilling a silver project in Arizona. Richard got a lot of stock for it. And that was the company that became Arizona Mining and made the big Taylor discovery or rediscovery, you could call it. And that, that became his biggest win. Uh, he, he made 550 million out of that deal. And that started all with Riva Gold selling to Wildcat. Hmm. I'm also thinking, I'm trying to look up the presentation that Dave gave at the pre PDEC event of network networking stocks, because now we're going into that territory here, right? And I'm thinking, where did Richard Work make that leap? And how much of the success that he's having now is due to him being one of the, the heads of networks, if you will? Um, because I think that would count. I mean, right, you would count Richard Work as, as one of the networks that create these network stocks, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think he's, um, well, there's not a, a real top 10, but if you make it top 10 of, of networks or uh, big names in the mining industry, people who made it, uh, he's certainly one of them, together with BD and Lasson and Sprott and a number of others. Yeah. Well, so is the success that he's having now yeah, I mean, it's it's probably a combination of everything we talked about. It's it's talent, it's brains, it's skill, it's network, it's luck, it's, it's luck all these sure. things yep. uh, combined uh, that that are basically making his success. Now, does that mean he's in, invincible? Though, if you, I mean, would he have liked to ha already have sold Solaris, for example? Um, well, so. you know, Solaris is a is a really big position for him right now. I think. Um, let me look it up. I just numbers. I mean, the shares are currently worth $309 million. Uh, but this is also one of those deals that they started as a private company. Uh, he got involved. Uh, the Pathway Group was involved. So again, a network that Dave talked about that works together on one deal. Um, this is even a David Lowell project um, mm -hmm. that they put into Solaris and they made a discovery and is currently 
uh, a company that may even be the Chinese are likely interested in taking it over, but are the Canadian is the Canadian government going to allow it? Um, I mean, for sure, his, those shares are worth north of three hundred million dollars right now, and will probably be liquidated at some point. And I think again that um, once you have one big success behind your name, or maybe two big success behind your name, then things start to become easier because people want to invest with you. Uh, they, they will beg you to be part of your, of your deal. And I, I guess that he also had periods where he had to beg people to become part of his deal. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's also, it's it, I see it sometimes as people almost think that people like this are you know, the holy God. Uh, I, I mean, if the Lundin family joins a company, the company is instantly worth more because you know that they are not dealing with bad projects or bad companies. Uh, but also it's just people following, uh, following the leader. And he is one of those industry leaders um, right now and everybody will follow him. Um, he even has a number of shells uh, like Armor Minerals, I think it's called. And uh, he also owns Titan. I think it's not a name that you hear very often. It's, it's a company that's around for a long time, but um, is not really mentioned a whole lot in the, uh, not on the social media space at least. So um, yeah, he, he certainly got himself into a position uh, to be a real leader in the industry, in the industry uh, which really happened in the last 20 years. Hmm. Okay, got it. So that, that's all I have to do. I just have to sell a company for a billion and a half dollars and then I'm off to the races. That's uh, it's on, uh, easy, good. It's on, it's on the list now. Do you ever go into area police yourself? I wrote it down, but I forgot to ask you, like neurology when you see something. Mm -hmm. Maybe for a well, if if there's a really strong market and something obviously is becoming a hype, then I would probably play trade a stock like that. But uh, in most cases, they almost never lead to anything. Uh, one of the few ones, one of the few that that really worked was the one with SK Creek, the one that uh, Murray Pezin was involved with. There were like three or four companies involved in that discovery. Uh, but in most cases, it's just one company. And for some reason, uh, it's very difficult for companies to repeat that success. And, and sometimes it happens in a later stage. Um, for example, Barksdale right now is, is, is trying to discover the extension of South 32, the Arizona deal that uh, Richard did. Um, I mean, there are other companies that are exploring around mines because that's often where you find another one. Uh, but typically, when it really happens, when a new discovery happens, and all all these different parties jump into that same area, in the short term, it doesn't often lead to something meaningful. Uh, so I, I do assess it, um, but I'm not the first one to buy these things unless the story is so big, like Novo, Novo Resources in 2017, uh, which didn't lead to a big success, I think. Uh, but lots and lots of companies went up 10x because of somebody else's uh, discovery, the nugget, uh, the gold nugget discovery. To to paraphrase uh, someone we both know, when you mentioned that company, there's a special spot in my body that kind of tingles when I'm reminded of it. So I'd, I'd rather not be reminded of it. But that aside, gee, these companies, I'm looking at these names and it, it'll take me a while to go through all of them. But how many of, of those projects that Richard was involved with do you think are now in production regardless of of commodity irrespective yeah mm -hmm. it's it's a question I cannot answer to be honest it's uh I I do know for example that that there's also a number of success stories like Tetian resources they were sold to Adriatic but that project is not successful right now so the outcome for the company was successful the outcome for the project right so far is not successful mm -hmm. The other way around, uh, a project that may have been sitting in dynamic ventures or uh, Kenley developments, or uh, when there was a project in Italy, even Sargold Resources. Um, I think many projects probably failed, but I have no idea if there were, there were projects in one of these 50 or 60 names that over time were rediscovered and, and led to something very meaningful. Um, yeah, I can simply not ask answer that question. <laughs> to be honest, what what I'm asking, why I'm asking, and why I'm thinking about it is because I've recently started taking a, a larger interest in geology and understanding everything from the exploration, sort of when it's a geophysical anomaly, all the way through 
continuity and, and strip and dilution and yada, 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 and how much is the capex going to be and how much is going to cost to build a road and so on and so forth, as in trying to understand, is this thing ever going to be a mine? And if the answer is it could be, then I might start getting interesting, interested. But if the answer is it's never going to be, then I don't get interested. But is that a right approach? And and does it even make sense for me? Because these things are hard to me. Like I, I I barely make sense of all these geological stuff and the mining engineering stuff. And I, it's very hard to me. So do I put time and effort into understanding that if I want to make money on the stocks or does that not really matter? Because if, if only out of these, what is 60 companies or something like that, if only one of them is in production, but the man became a billionaire by being involved in all of them, then that tells me that maybe I shouldn't care about what goes into production. I should care about what's going to make the stock price go up. I think knowing what is going in production is not telling you much uh, because some companies have to dilute so much over time uh, that even if the, if the complete thing is brought to production, nobody makes money. These things happen in this business. Um, um, I think when you look back at these stories um when in, in 2002 i think warwick's name was out there uh, already and he was known he was not the big guy yet so maybe those names the ones that already show that they have potential but didn't really make a big score yet are the ones to bet on because you can still get you know in those companies for quite cheap if you now want to buy a Warwick company like highlander for example there was a, a short window when you could have bought highlander at 15 cents but right now it's 70. Uh, so betting on these companies, um, even if a project within Warwick's company fails, chances are that he will find a new one or his team finds a new one. Uh, so that's why a lot of people like investing in people because they make it work regardless. Um, if you have somebody who doesn't have that network effect and is, for example, a very good geologist, uh, but do didn't have the luck in company number one or perhaps company number two, maybe that person never will never lead you to a big success um, because it took work 50 companies to really uh, make this big score. Um, so what are the odds investing in a random geologist running one company? Um, so betting on somebody who recognizes when it, it's not working and finds a new project, finds a new deal, uh, finds a new promote, is probably the safer way to go. Especially if you look at, for example, I was looking at the list of companies he currently owns and which ones are meaningful for him. For example, Armour Minerals is really a shell. It's actually a shell, uh, which is trading for, I think, $50 million and he owns probably half of it. Um, I don't know if, if there's a real incentive for, for him because he is wealthy and he doesn't need the money, but... Uh, is it a good idea to invest in Armour Minerals? Um, because at some point, that company will do something. Um, and his shares, in theory, are worth $24 million. So is it safer to invest in Armour without a project? Or is it safer to invest in a project, like you said, that has a good chance to go in production, but still has to issue 500 million shares to, to do so? Hmm. Um, I think that's that's the discussion you can have about it. And I, I think it's probably safer if you just choose one option to always go with the people like work than to go with a project that may go in production, but the people running it have really a lot of difficulties raising $1 million. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. I've seen that, that last part because it, then it's not really only the raising, it gets complicated on other fronts too. It could be a First Nations issue that maybe they don't exactly know how to resolve. There could be a permitting issue. There could be a, a BLM dispute. Those are all things that I have seen where I think Great Rocks, what's happening? Like four years ago, they were Great Rocks too, but apparently over those four years, nothing happened. They had to dilute um, by 200% or whatever it might be. Um, what criteria, and this is a question we I, I would ask Richard if, if he'd ever come on, but what criteria has he used and does he keep using, could you, by looking at those names, could you reverse engineer it? Like, do you know what he's looking for when he goes into a deal? Mm. Well, for sure. I mean, all these people look for promotable deals, I think. Uh, sometimes they they use a project. Maybe they already know that the project is not 
going to be the one, but they use it to get the share price to get people excited. And when people are excited, share price goes up. When a higher share price, you can do more things and you can buy a project like uh, they are buying uh, Highlanders buying the SSR project, high grade silver in Peru. Um, so sometimes, I mean, you always have to pay a bit of a premium. The moment a, a big name shows up in one of those companies, especially if they show up one out of the blue, everybody will jump on it. Um, if you are in the company that if you, if you get lucky and you, you buy a company and after you a work comes in or a Ross Beattie comes in or Pierre Lassonde comes in. Um, so reverse engineering, what I do sometimes is I look for companies that either have a project that could be of interest or sometimes just a vehicle that could be of interest. And sometimes people need a vehicle to put it in a project. So if you find connections of work, for example, and you see that they are running a company and let's just assume that that 10 people own 80% of the company or 50% of the company. If, if, if work would need a new shell or a new project, I don't think he needs one because he has enough of that. But then they would often look for a clean company, uh, something that where, where you only have a number of shareholders so that they can position people and they can get a company going without having uh, 5,000 people selling into the first up move. Um, so these things often start in a clean shell uh, for work I think he has enough companies to put projects into if um, if he had to st start something on his own but uh, perhaps he gets I mean he also does deals together with other promoters like the Pathway Group or um, Ross Beatty um, so sometimes it is a combined effort and and then look for those people and try to position yourself in those but yeah, to, to reverse engineer, I mean, you don't have to invest alongside work, but you, I think it's a good idea to invest alongside those type, type of people. And sometimes you can see signs early that this could be such a company. But what kind of an edge could I even have in those stories, though? Because everyone knows Ross Beatty's Ross Beatty, and everyone knows Richard Work is Richard Work. I don't, they, they, uh, they don't have more information than I do. So when, when he goes in, the market goes in with him stock price goes up, where is my edge? Where is, like, if it's a $3 million company, $5 million company that that has rocks that I could, I don't know, go and visit, talk to five geologists about it, read textbooks, just do boring, laborious stuff that nobody wants to do. I see, like, I could have an edge. I'm not going to have an edge over you or over the very smart people who were in, in it before me, but I'm still going to have an edge over most of the market. Whereas when big names attract a lot of attention, a lot of people are already going to flock to the stock. And and so my edge completely disappears. So yeah, how do you how do you reconcile that? Yeah, I think you can it's very difficult to be part of those early deals. So I mean you need to have a very good network. And he started with a within a very good network. So I think that got him going. And and look at the big names. Um I don't want to take away from their success because they have done good things, but a lot of people uh, started in Vancouver, somehow got involved with people. Um, because starting a company is, you need several, you need lawyers, you need people f arranging your finance finances, you have to get the shell going. I think I, I wouldn't even know where to start. And I've looked at tens of thousands of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you have an idea, you want to start something on your own, you still have to uh, surround yourself with people who have done it before. And he did it in the 80s. Uh, he got people around him. And he saw how it happened. And um, I mean, Frank Justra invests in companies, helps young people get to, to get going. Uh, he has the people around him. He already built this sort of framework where they can start companies um, and have the people to join on boards. And um, so so you, if you're just sitting at home and a lot of studying sometimes helps you to find these things a bit earlier than the rest. Um, G mining, for example, if you really paid attention, you could have seen that that the Geniacs were coming in around 40, 50 cents. Uh, that got you the first double because the first deal was 80 cents, uh, the, the first big public deal. Uh, so sometimes you can find these things by really looking hard. Um, but, but it's, of course, easier if you are already within the network and you are invited to join those first rounds. And I'm not often invited to those things, or I'm, almost never. Um, so getting into those networks is probably the, the wisest thing to do. And, and but it's probably 
no longer the same as it was in the 80s, right, where he had to physically be in Vancouver. I mean, I look at you, for example, I consider you a, a very, I consider you, you made it in the way I look at it. I, I would love to be where you're at. And uh, I don't, I don't necessarily want to be a billionaire. This is what I tell my wife every time when a when a guy with a six pack and and very jacked comes on TV. I'm like, oh no, he's too jacked. I don't want to be like him. Who would like to be like him? It's crazy. And but so I consider you very successful, and you've done it from a country far away from where the action really happens by going to conferences though and digging and digging and digging and talking to people and building that network. But with the help of the internet, it's I mean, it's definitely different. If this was the '80s. And I don't want to diminish your success, obviously, but if this was the 80s, you would have probably had to have been physically in Toronto or Vancouver to get to where you're at. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, so I'm not really, I'm, I have a okay network. Uh, so that, that, that grew over time to go to Indy, to, con to go to conferences and meet people and, and sometimes mm. be a bit lucky with meeting people. Um, um, so for sure, being there was more important, I think, at the time. Uh, it's still, I'm still not involved in a network that creates companies uh, like involved in a network like Justra, Work, or uh, so what I do is I look for opportunities myself. I don't really have a big edge. Uh, I, I'm trying to get the edge by knowing more than others and talking to companies time and time again. Um, but that doesn't give me like 5 million shares for at one cent. I have to buy it in the market. So it, it, the, the growth curve is going so much slower then when you have, for example, 10 or 20 million shares, which you can give yourself as a founder, uh, because you are the one with the idea, you are the one with, you know, who is putting everything together, perhaps with some help. Um, so I think there's no way around it than just going to these conferences, going, you know, do try to do something. And I think you and Fukashin did a really good job with um, Awali. Uh, you didn't start Awali, but you saw an opportunity and, and became... I wouldn't say activist, but started to get involved and do things. So if you don't try, you don't reach anything. I've tried like 10, 10 of those things and nine of those failed. I only for once was involved in a little bit of a deal and I wasn't even a big player in the deal, but I came with an idea and talks were going and, and it led to something. But um, uh, so Awali is an example that you, that you and Fukashin and other young people are, are trying something and, and you have to try lots of those things. And eventually something will work out. And I think Awali works out for you already right now. Um, uh, so I think that's the best chance you have to really try to make it. And uh, I think Richard Warwick was really young when he started. Uh, and his first really big win, like the, the Augusta Resource one with Hood Bay, um, or maybe Fantana, he was already in his, close to his 50s, I think, at the time. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, you have to just keep trying and enjoy it i think if you don't enjoy it and you just do it for the money it's not going to work um mm. you, you need to have a certain passion for it and i enjoy this still a whole really a lot and i don't know if i want to I, I will never become a rigid work and i don't know if i want to be because you also have to promote like crazy and sometimes in bad times you still need to talk to investors and it's probably a stressful job um so even though a lot of people would like to be him, I don't. I think it's not always easy. Uh, and of course, for him, it's probably now a bit easier. But I'm sure he had some difficult times in his career uh, when trying to do things in Italy and trying to do things in Arizona um, on the environmental front. Um, investors perhaps losing money, uh, losing money yourself in a bankruptcy. I think you have to you have to go through a lot of stress to get into a position like this. Yeah, re resilience. Res no, I'm not going to be able to see it, so I'm not even trying. But you have to be resilient to uh, to 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 get through these things, I suppose. Yep, uh, again, yep. what do I know? Um, this is good. This is very good. You've, you've you've managed to destroy my hope at the beginning and then build it back up. So I appreciate that, and it's been very. We should do story time more often. What did you think? Yeah, I agree. I hope this was helpful. Uh, I think the information that I looked up was extremely interesting, and I hope we conveyed it in a way that was still people could still follow it because uh, it's it's sometimes easy to understand a story but then to bring it to the audience is more difficult so hopefully next time it's getting better but i think we should try it again uh, at some point uh, by selecting another will and uh, and trying to get that message across and see what what brought these people into um, the position they are right now all right that's it Thanks so much, Luke. If people are listening and want us to go through someone, um, first of all, go to Gold Discovery. 
one on Twitter and scroll scroll through the, the the post that Luke has made. There's interesting stories in there. And if you have someone in mind who you think we should go through, I'd be more than happy to do it. So put it in the comments or tag us or whatever kids do these days. But Luke, thank you so much. Thanks.